back in 2006, I was sitting in front of Cardi's desk. I was really nervous. She literally held my future in her hands. She looked up from my CV, pushed her glasses up and said, Let's sum it up, Alman. You have been a drug addict, a criminal, you have spent several years in prison, you delivered guns for a homicide. In addition, you have a crippling debt. Is that correct? I nodded. It was all true. I was applying for the position as a debt consultant at the Norwegian Social Services. Let's go back a few years. This is me, on the way into court, accused for delivering guns for a triple homicide back in 99. Would you say that this is a face of a repenting sinner? It's not. In fact, I really enjoyed the attention the media gave me. That gave me street cred. This is a man you shouldn't pay late for your drugs. This is also me. I was becoming a national advisor for the personal economy sector. And here I was holding a talk about the devastating effects on crippling debt. So how is it possible to go from this to this? I did a lot of the job myself, but I needed other people. I needed trust and I needed brave leadership. But first, I want to give you some context. I grew up in a beautiful island in the west of Norway with my parents and siblings. And it was really happy times. I dreamt about becoming a soccer star and having a lot of friends. But in my teens, I got bullied a bit. And I discovered that money, that can buy me friends. And the feeling the money gave me was also very good. And I got some money from my grandfather, but his money wasn't enough. So I had to steal a bit from his wallet from time to time. And even today, I feel a bit ashamed of that. But at that time, it was needed. Because I needed to have the right shoes, the right clothes, just to fit in. And I was very generous with grandfather's money. I wasn't good enough to become a soccer star. And that was a defeat. Instead, I developed an unhealthy relationship with money. In fact, I would call it an addiction. So when I started the job as a doorman at popular clubs, I met people with access to easy money. And soon I was supplying steroids for bodybuilders and then drugs. This was followed by 10 years of a never-ending party. I produced GHB, a, a liquid drug, and we were in, in labs, uh, but we didn't have the white coats, you know, so... Uh, and I was really good at being a professional criminal. I could get you anything you wanted. I could get you guns, cocaine, ecstasy, speed, fraud, you name it. But slowly, I got hooked on my own drugs. I did mistakes. I got arrested. And from being a top criminal, I went to go to a person with no control over his life. I even took five overdoses in 10 days. Behind these prison walls, on New Year's Eve of the millennium year 2000, there's a skinny man sitting on the prison cell, screaming. He's looking out and see the fireworks coloring the sky. And he can imagine all the happy people around. He's not happy. He don't have any New Year's wishes. Well, he had one to let go. He didn't want to live anymore. I didn't kill myself. 
I got out. And soon I was arrested again. But something happened the next time the police was going to arrest me. Instead of handcuffs and shoveling me into the police car and into a prison cell, the police officer sat down next to me and he held his arms around me and he said, Hey mate, it doesn't look good. Is there anything I can do to help you? And never had anyone got that close to my heart as he did that night. It was like, it was like he cared about me. I have never experienced that before. And you know, criminals and police are not supposed to be friends. And that conversation just lasted for a couple of minutes. But it changed my life forever. Something in my brain switched. And I thought, there might be a way out for me as well. And there was a way out for me, but it took years. And I had to work really hard. I got back to university, took education. And when I was finished with that, I was going to apply for a job. But hey, have you seen my CV? It was not pretty. Kari looks up at me again. What I didn't know at that time was that she really fought for me so I can get to this interview. The other leaders, they thought she were crazy. What if I relapsed? Showed up drunk or on drugs? Or even assaulted a client? Another headline in the national newspaper, right? So she was taking a risk. But then she asked me two crucial questions, which are not a part of any traditional rule book for interviews. And then she hired me. Since then, I have worked with thousands of people. First, I have advised clients how to deal with their debt. And my secret was that I shared my experience on how I got out of it. And secondly, I have taught hundreds of my colleagues how to do exactly the same with their clients, but not having to have the same experience that I have. I didn't disappoint Cardi. I didn't dare. She gave me trust and I gave her my loyalty. That's what's happened when people not used to getting trust suddenly receives trust. I really wanted to fight for Cardi's choice. And since then, I've been working 15 years in Cardi's organization. Loyalty is one of the benefits of hiring ex-criminals. And here I'm going to give you a few more. When your employee has the same background and education, your organization becomes static. According to culture, background and gender, it is a well-established routine in good organization. But what about ex-criminals? Because ex-criminals have seen another part of the world from a different angle. They are used to solve things differently. And because of that, they think differently. Criminals have a great work ethic. If you have no money, no safety net from the state or no consistent lifestyle, then you need to work fast and hard to get money to survive. Or else you will get caught by the police. But you also have to stick with the criminal codes. And here, breaking those rules, there are no written warning. This means that an ex-criminal are good at following employer's rule. Criminals are goal-driven. They don't have time to spend six months on a school project. They want results fast. And ex-criminals can see solutions faster than a student fresh out of university. And criminals have a great work capacity. There are no 9 to 5 jobs at the street. You work until the job is done. It's not like criminals doesn't know the difference between right or wrong. Or don't care about risks. They think about it all the time. An ex-criminal can clearly tell you whether a choice comes with a great risk. After all, there are no greater consequences than getting caught by the police and spending time 
in prison. How many of you regularly take business decisions when the police are actively testing your results? Criminals are master in communication and relationship. They have to move between people who one day can be their friends and the next day can be their enemy. That means they have to use all their senses all the time to discover is this situation of any danger to me. They often become good salesperson because they quickly understand what the customers need. And they are also very good in keeping their mouth shut of obvious reasons. But that means they are great listeners. And who doesn't want to meet people that are good in listening? And they are also used to work under poor and rapidly changing condition. And the business world needs people who knows how to adapt. Today, I'm using my experience in a new recruitment organization. Our main purpose is to build bridges between the ex-criminals and the business world. We train the candidate to convert their skills and make them relevant for the employers. On the other hand, I teach and assist employers how to change job descriptions, how to do the interview and how to get the best out of the candidate so they really feel wanted. Yes, this job is made for me. I really want this job. This is the feeling we want to create. Kari wasn't naive. And to be fair, it wasn't the first time I have spoken to someone with power. Like the police or a top criminal boss. I knew how to be charming. And Kari saw that. But she also saw the potential in me, so she gave me the opportunity. And she trusted me. So what can you do about all this? The next time you're holding a CV with gaps in, think of me. And then I want you to do what Kari did. She completely changed the game when she asked these two simple but extremely powerful questions. So tell me, Arman, what did you learn from these gaps in your CV? And how can what you learn help us? Because if you ask those two questions, you will make your candidate and your company shine. Thanks for your time.